Hello again, and welcome to another edition of World Chronicle. And here at United Nations headquarters in New York is the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, who's just addressed the annual session of the General Assembly. He's Mr. Rana Singha Premadasa. With me to interview our guest are three journalists. Tazi Vitachi, a columnist for Newsweek International, Pauline Frederick, foreign affairs commentator for National Public Radio, and Michael Littlejohns, the chief United Nations correspondent of Reuters. Our guest today is Rana Singha Premadasa. He was born in 1924 in Colombo, Sri Lanka, in what was then known as Ceylon. Mr. Premadasa is a well-known writer, poet, and orator in his country. He's the eighth Prime Minister of the Independent Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, and he assumed that office in February 1978. In addition to being the Prime Minister, he also holds the portfolio of local government, <coughs> housing and construction. In Parliament, he is also the leader of the House. Mr Prime Minister, we're delighted to have you with us today on this edition of World Chronicle. And here with our first question for you is Michael Littlejohns. Mr Prime Minister, as you know, there's um, talk of a move to eject Israel, the Israeli delegation at any rate, from the UN General Assembly. And President Carter has served notice that if this should happen, the United States would pull out of the United Nations. What is the attitude of uh, Sri Lanka, your government, to this question and uh, to the whole question of withdrawing representation of uh, member states in the General Assembly, as of course happened in the case of South Africa in 1974 and set a precedent for the possible action against Israel? In an organization like the United Nations, we would like all sovereign states to be represented. In regard to the present situation, we haven't given much thought of it. But basically, I should say that our attitude is that all should get their representation on a world, world body like this. You are, your country is a former chairman of the non-aligned movement. Uh, are you aware of any um, majority position on this question in the non-aligned movement? Has it been discussed at all in the movement? No, not to my knowledge. This is purely an Arab initiative as far as you know? I think so. Mr. Prime Minister, um, as we all know, the <coughs> United States has agreed to sell enriched uranium to India without receiving in return any promise of safeguards or India belonging to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Does this give you any concern? As far as India is concerned, uh, we have a lot of confidence as far as matters of this nature are concerned. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi herself had stated that she will be using these energies for peaceful purposes and we can uh, trust her. There is a possibility also that Pakistan has been developing uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, do you know anything about that and has that concerned you? Uh, not very much. In other words, um, what seems to be proliferation of this uh, terrible uh, material in spite of the non-proliferation treaty is going ahead at a fast pace. Many nations are now um, finding this available and, and making some use of it. Unless, of course, they are made use for <clears throat> peaceful purposes. Otherwise, it gives concern for all parties because we are wedded to the policy of peace. But can you be sure these nations that have this material are going to use it for peaceful purposes when they will not agree to give any safeguards along that line or make it possible to have any inspection? It's better to have <coughs> safeguards and it is nothing but fair that they should utilize them for peaceful purposes. Prime Minister, you said uh, yesterday at the General Assembly um, that uh, you would like to see the, uh, the United Nations declare uh, International Year of Housing. That's right. Can you tell us something about the thinking behind that? But it must ob obviously come from your own concerns as Minister of Housing in Sri Lanka. We are all concerned about the quality of life of our people. And basically I think a uh, good sanitary environment and uh, better living conditions 
make the attitudes of people change for the better. Uh, in fact, uh, in my own country, I think half the population live in very uh, insanitary conditions. They, in the towns, they live in uh, shanties and slums. In the rural areas, too, they are living in uh, very uh, unsatisfactory conditions. So housing is basically a primary need of every person concerned with a better house his thinking also will improve to a great extent. I think on this socio-economic question, it was interesting, Mr. Prime Minister, to note that you said in your speech that developing countries should have a greater share of the world's industrial output. I think you said as much as 25% by the year 2000. But surely, uh, I suppose you realize that the uh, present tensions are, uh, are very depressing. They're holding back the North-South dialogue. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the progress of that dialogue? It seems to have come to almost a halt. Yes, we are not uh, satisfied at all, because the progress seems to be very poor, as I indicated in my speech. Unless uh, we have uh, justice and equality among the nations of the world, you can't expect peace. Where would you put the blame for holding it up? I think the developed countries will have to share the blame for it. It is nothing but fair that they must think of others. Mm. Seventy percent of the world's population live in the third world. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Prime Minister, why is it that the developing countries seem to, <coughs> excuse me, seem to place most of the blame for the failure of the UN General Assembly special session? on uh, economic development in August and September on the Western countries, as you have just done now, uh, at least on the developed countries, and by that presumably you mean primarily the West, although of course the Soviet Union and some others of, of the Soviet bloc are developed too, um, rather than on OPEC, which um, is largely responsible for the economic problems which now beset the developed countries also. It seems to me that, um, in fact, before the special session began, the ministerial meeting of the group of 77 developing countries came out with a statement which laid the blame almost exclusively on the West. Yes, the developed countries put the blame on the OPEC countries. And the OPEC countries put the blame on the developed countries. <laughs> and uh, we, in the third world, are sandwiched between them. What we are saying, I have uh, shown it in a chart, it's an addendum to my speech. I made to the General Assembly yesterday that more than 70% of the world's population live in the third world. And when you see this chart, you will see where the prosperity has been kept without allowing it to flow to other countries, especially the third world countries. But the other countries no are third world countries too. That's right. But there is no purpose in putting <coughs> the ball from one court to another without sitting down and talking it out and settling it for the good of all. So what do you think should be done that hasn't been done already? I personally think that the leadership should be taken by the developed countries in this instance. They must come out and set an example to others. In what respect, sir? In respect of uh, sharing the prosperity of the world. With but, others. but their argument is that they're not as prosperous as they used to be because of the OPEC's uh, raising the price of, of uh, very important uh, commodity over the years and continuing to do so. Yes, you can argue like that and go on forever. But nothing will come out of it. it I mean, must look look at my own back. country, the United Kingdom, where they have uh, enormous unemployment problem at the moment. I mean, what the United Kingdom, the United States and West Germany, as you know, were the three Western countries, which uh, were blamed primarily for the failure of the special session of the General Assembly. But uh, the, the, certainly in the case of the United States and the United Kingdom, these are, these are two countries which have enormous problems of their own. Rising unemployment, inflation, all the other economic ills that beset the world. You'll see that uh, the consumer market is in the third world countries, as far as population is concerned. It is in the in interest of the developed countries themselves to help to improve the conditions of the poorer countries and the third world countries because their uh, manufacturers 
manufactured goods will get a ready market in these countries. And if the de developing countries have no resources for that, it will affect the developed countries in a bigger way. It is in their own interest that they should come out. <clears throat> Mr. Prime Minister, with, uh, with all due respect to your placing the first priority in your program on housing, which sounds very important, <coughs> and uh, expecting really some help from the developed countries, uh, what can you expect from them when their first priority is the arms race? That is why we are urging that they should look at the world realistically. As you say, they are more concerned about armaments. They are spending so much of money, not only in producing them, but also in maintaining them. What we are saying is, why can't you at least spend part of that or utilize part of that to raise the standard of living of the people in the third world countries, in the poorer countries. Even otherwise, we don't mind. Let them stop this mad race and utilize that money for their own purposes. And I know there will be a better return to the poorer countries. But each is uh, presumably going ahead with the arms race on grounds of that its own security requires it. How do you uh, convince them uh, that uh, they uh, could be secure without uh, spending so much on the arms race. That is why I said yesterday that the root cause of all these things is uh, dependent on the moral crisis that is prevailing. Prime um, Minister, you, uh, your argument that um, the, the, the largest part of the world's population is in the south, in the, de in the developing countries, and that it's um, it's in the self-interest of the developed world That's right. to help them to become better consumers is the same argument that um, the Brand Commission That's right. uh, brought out. Yes. And it is a very widely prevalent uh, attitude among people concerned with development. Uh, there's a counter-argument to this yes. that Professor Bauer of Washington yes. uh, made a, f a few weeks ago that this is like saying to a supermarket proprietor who had been robbed, that at least uh, now those people who robbed him have the means to uh, buy the goods in his supermarket. <laughs> How would you counter this one? <laughs> uh, I don't think. Because I think it's a spurious argument myself. Yeah. But I'd like to hear your views on that subject. I don't think that argument hold. Uh so strongly against what I said earlier. A matter of argument, you can adduce all sorts of things. But I personally think that it is in the interest of the developed countries to look at the plight of the developing countries and to share their prosperity with them. Prime Minister, you know, I have seen over the years, over the last five, six, seven years, a kind of um, boredom with the subject of development, yes. a kind of boredom that I see widely, widely prevailing in the West. Uh, I particularly noticed first in, uh, in England, um, which used to take a great interest in the, in the, in the rest of the world as, as an imperial power. And it has been spreading right across the Western world, the industrialized world. So that in Washington DC, for instance, there's an, uh, a tremendous rise in the objections, yes. the lobby that is anti-aid. anti, anti -aid. Hmm? Um, it's a, Even the World Bank is finding it very difficult to get its funds from uh, support for the funds from Congress. Hmm? Now, what do you attribute this kind of boredom to? In the West, one can identify some things like um, they say, well, aid has not worked. Uh, it has not produced gratitude from the recipient countries. What are your observations about that? Have you observed also this aid boredom? Yes, uh, I have observed. But uh, my contention is that there should be a complete change in the basic thinking of all these matters. Uh, development, for whose sake and for whose benefit, 
development is for the sake of the people, for their cause. That is the thinking that should come out. And also, I think we have passed the era in restricting ourselves to our area of jurisdiction, or our own country, or our own uh, district. I think we have to think universally of mankind. And that sort of new thinking has to emerge. And uh, the emphasis should be on the upliftment of the human being not his uh, physical and spiritual development has to be taken up. Well, that was one of the elements in the Brandt Commission, of course, interdependence, economic right. interdependence. But I think while the Brandt Commission said so many fine things about that principle, it seems that uh, unless something is going to be done, the report of the Brandt Commission is going to be left on the shelf. That is what I myself told yesterday. But we can't allow it to happen so. Something has to be done. We keep coming back, uh, obviously this is the great question today, we keep coming back to the root causes of all this. Michael was talking about, Tais has been talking about, and Pauline has. Uh, I mean, we do come back to this question, but what can be done, either to break down mistrust or break down uh, uh, apathy, something like this? It can't no, I change, I don't think, just like that, can it? I don't think that we should lose heart. But the world is moving forward. We have to carry on this and convince, convert people to this line of thinking. And I have uh, great faith in mankind. There is no doubt that uh, the day will dawn when everybody will be thinking differently. How would you say that, Prime Minister, in the, <coughs> when we see every day? The fact of the matter is that the, the cost of armament, the expenditure on armaments, has now come to uh, a million dollars a minute. I was told uh, 450 billion US dollars a year a year yeah but in that in that setting of people grinding away at armaments which in fact are the whole point of these armaments most of these armaments is that they are useless they have to be useless because they were useful yeah. that we won't be around to talk like this yes <laughs> now such idiocy in front of all the poverty in the world how are you going to how do you express such a note of hope that you have just expressed? Yes. In this kind of mentality, when, while this kind of mentality prevails? There was an era when they not only produced arm, they used it. But we have moved out of that area. They are now producing it and maintaining it, but not using it. Uh, because of a world body like the United Nations was established, and there is closer rapport between the nations. So we have moved from that dreadful area to an area that they are sitting back and thinking before using them. So if we pursue this policy, I have great faith that we will be able to achieve our objective. I think a former American ambassador, Charles Yost, once said that if you don't use this armament that's being built up, it's the biggest boondoggle in history. <laughs> uh, incidentally, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, there's been some publicity to the effect that George Ball, the former Under Secretary of State, has become a particular advisor to Sri Lanka. Could you tell us what you expect him to do? I can't uh, make any comment at this juncture. But he is an, your advisor now. Yes, I was told. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also, I think, touched in a few moments ago about the economic aspects as, as well. Uh, the, I suppose, the credibility of the United Nations. Uh, we've just gone through a special session on, on world affairs economically, which hasn't produced anything. And everybody feels the frustrations. You yourself have said that the credibility of the United Nations is being doubted today. Question, yes. What did you mean by that exactly? You know, I think... Uh People think that the United Nations have not moved faster. They accept the position. It has served a very useful purpose. But uh, it has not moved faster. And uh, certain people even think that it is not very effective as it should be. But these views are there. <laughs>
Well, my colleagues here have watched the United Nations in action more years than I have, and perhaps we might just take up that for a minute, because it's a question which seems to me everybody's constantly asking at one time or another. Is the United Nations effective enough? And if it isn't, why? But the criticism is always, you know, what is the United Nations doing? For instance, in the Iraq-Iran war, what is the United Nations doing? It took a week before the Security Council finally adopted a resolution. But people don't seem to realize, and I'm not saying this because I particularly want to defend the United Nations, I wish to be a neutral observer, but the people seem outside the organization seem to ignore the fact that this is an organization of 154 member states. So when you say, say that uh, the United Nations has not moved fast enough and has not done enough, it's the 154 member states quite, who haven't quite. done enough, correct? It's not that what I say, but this is yes. the impression of certain people. Mm. I but I fully agree with your contention. Mm. I would agree with Michael too, but I, I would like to add this, that I think it was uh, uh, the late Senator Arthur Vandenberg who one time talking about the United Nations said that it could be effective <coughs> Uh, if it were brought in uh, on the, not only on the crash landings, but on the start of the flight. Uh, the trouble is that too many times uh, everything else is tried and it doesn't work and then it's thrown to the United Nations and if the United Nations can't do anything about it, the United Nations gets blamed. The Secretary General said something along the same lines. Did he? Yeah. Well, very often, uh, Prime Minister, this, this is used as a kind of defense, a kind of cop-out. <coughs> Uh, I quite agree that m most people imagine that the that the glass house that you that people see in the uh, newspapers and the pictures is the United Nations. This is the Secretariat of the United Nations. The the UN is in fact 154 countries. Yes. So if the 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 state of the world therefore is what is reflected in the actions of the United Nations, but it is often used to avoid thinking about certain important things it seems to me that why is it why is it that there is uh, uh, so much difficulty about people coming together about countries coming together it is because we still maintain the whole structure on the basis of national sovereignties and this concept of sovereignties which started only about two three hundred years ago you know, nation states uh, it's being challenged. That's right. You, know, you, you speak of one world. That's right. The West talks about interdependence. I find that very few people in the South talk about interdependence. <laughs> interdependence is a Northern word, in fact. All it means really very often is, um, you Arabs, you have oil, we need it. Give it to us at reasonable prices or else. That is what inter interdependence usually means. I think everybody here also realizes that, uh, and it's a very fundamental, almost naive thing to say, but it's so true, that it requires a political will, doesn't it? Quite right. Something it to happen. Yeah, quite right. So, so, as far as your, your economic uh, questions are concerned, it does require the political will for them to move in that degree forward. That's right. Uh, in fact, uh, what the developing countries are asking is not charity from the mm. developed world. What we are asking is our due. You see, when you take the uh, increase in prices of various manufactured goods, what we import in Sri Lanka, very high in price, but we don't get the same high price for our exports. That justice is not forthcoming to developing countries. Now, this present oil crisis is mostly due to the fact that uh, Oil is required for servicing and maintenance of armaments. If not for that, I don't think there would have been such a big crisis. Mm. Uh, Brian, if there's time, I w would like to raise a, a more or less a philosophical question with the Prime Minister and view the fact that he made put so much emphasis in his speech to the General Assembly on the morality of, of the decisions that have to be made. General Douglas MacArthur explained way back in 1961 <clears throat> why uh, the abolition of war had been only a dream and had never been achieved and this is what he said and I wondered what the Prime Minister would think of it. The argument then, oh, people were talking about uh, abolishing war, was along spiritual and moral lines and lost. 
but now the tremendous evolution of nuclear and other potentials of destruction has suddenly taken the problem from its primary consideration and brought it abreast of scientific realism. It's no longer an ethical equation to be pondered solely by learned philosophers and ecclesiastics, but a hard core for the decision of the masses whose survival is now the issue. General Douglas MacArthur, who I'm right. sure you know. Oh, yes, knew. yes. And uh, our own view was expressed by me yesterday in my own speech. This tremendous greed that the world is developing in the course of all this trouble. I'd like to ask you, Prime Minister, uh, a, a question that is a domestic question for you, but for me, as a, as a journalist, a very important international question. I believe that Sri Lanka is the, is the first developing country <coughs> to be able to claim that it has lived through 50 years of continuous uh, democratic rule. That's right. Uh, you, you received, uh, uh, Sri Lanka received a universal franchise in 1931. 31. Uh, and you're celebrating? Yes, we are commemorating it in the next year. In fact, uh, we were able to obtain adult franchise when we were a colony under the British. And we have right through our people have enjoyed that right, human right, and we have used it very wisely, I should say. Mr. Prime Minister, I'd love to spend more time with that very interesting question. I know it was going to be a very interesting answer, but unfortunately time has beaten us again. We are delighted to have you with us. Uh, on this edition of World Chronicle and to answer our questions. Our guest has been the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Mr. Rana Singha Premadasa. The Prime Minister was interviewed here at United Nations headquarters in New York by Tazi Vatachi, columnist for Newsweek International, Pauline Frederick, foreign affairs commentator for National Public Radio, and Michael Littlejohns, chief of the United Nations Bureau of Reuters. And I'm Brian Saxton, thanking you for being with us and hoping you'll join us again for our next edition of World Chronicle.